I'd rather focus on the expression of how I play it than the notes. It would be like a somebody who uh, plays Shakespeare. He doesn't think about the words. It's the same words, uh, but it's the way he interprets them. And so I, I like to be freed from the burden of the notes. I like the notes to be good. I don't want to come up with the text on stage because it releases me of this burden of trying to find what am I going to say tonight. This is the program. This is what I want to say. I want to say certain things. And, I, and then it's how am I going to say them tonight? Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Keith Billick with another episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Welcome first time listeners and welcome back regular listeners. As always, I want to start this episode off by acknowledging the Patreon supporters of today's episode. Today, the the two supporters actually have something very cool in common. They're both either current or former students of Davy Jones, who any of you who have been listening since episode one will recognize that name, Davy Jones. He was the very first special guest on the Picky Fingers Banjo podcast. So go back to episode one if you want to hear about him. But two of his students chose to support the show on Patreon, which is really cool. So uh, Davey, whatever you're doing to, to steer them this way, keep it up, man. I really appreciate that. The supporters in question, one is named Ron Chapman. I don't really know how old Ron is, and I, I wasn't going to be so impolite as to ask, but he just says that he found the banjo late in life and was lucky enough to find Davy to give him some lessons. So, Ron, I'm glad. Better late than never, man. No time like the present, right? And I hope you're having fun with it. And Davy will definitely keep you on the right track. Another one of Davy's former students, Jacob Howcroft, um, now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. And something really cool about Jacob, a lot of us saw the Google Doodle, you know, the, the picture that shows up when you go to do your Google search. And back in January, there was an Earl Scruggs-themed doodle. Well, Jacob is the man that we have to to thank for that. He works for Google and and is on the team of of the designers for that. So not only did he develop that, but he he also had a part in the Bach-themed Google Doodle. So he's he's making sure that all those Google users know who who Scruggs is and get to enjoy some good music themed google doodles so uh jacob and ron thank you so much for supporting the podcast anybody else who'd like to become a patreon supporter should go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast that site will tell you how to become a supporter of the show every little bit really does count so thank you to everyone who who's gone to that site to pitch in a little bit to keep the show moving another sponsor of today's show is peghead nation and you're going to hear a little bit more about Peghead Nation later on in the episode, so stay tuned for that. I'm going to give you a coupon code that will offer Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast listeners the chance to get 30 days of free streaming video instruction from some of the top teachers in the business. So, like I said, stay tuned for that. So what else do I have going on lately? There's a, there are a few things that I, I wanted to let all of you listeners know about. It occurred to me recently that I had been playing the exact same setup on my banjo for for many many years in terms of tailpiece, bridge, strings, all that all that stuff, and and it's good. I'm I'm happy to have found something that that I've been happy with, but the bug kind of bit me. So I've been buying bridges up left and right. So I want to hear your bridge recommendations. If if any of you have a bridge that you really swear by that I need to try. I've been buying most of the of the popular ones out there, so chances are I might already have what you have to recommend me, but I don't want to influence the responses I get. So email me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. Let me know what your favorite bridge is, and if it's something that I have not tried yet, I will definitely look into it and possibly order one to, to compare. Along the same lines, any of you who follow me on Facebook may have read about a a thread that I started recently about a live microphone shootout. You've heard me ask everyone what their live microphone of choice is, and I started a thread on Facebook about other people's choices. A future episode coming up here 
is going to be a microphone shootout where you're going to hear me record myself playing through all the major popular choices that people tend to have for live microphones. So another thing to email me about at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. If you have a live microphone that you really swear by and love, or on the other hand, if there's one that you have really been looking into and have heard about, but maybe haven't had a chance to hear it or don't have an opinion about it, shoot me the, the make and model of the microphone that you would like to hear. And if at all possible, I will try to include it. Now, of course, that's going to be restrained by my ability to find one, but I, I have several microphones. I have some friends with microphones, so hopefully I can track them down. And again, this is live microphones, so suggesting some sort of real high-end $10,000 Neumann, that's not what I'm looking for here. I'm gonna, It's going to be the a lot of the popular clip-on choices, the SM57, and, and a bunch of those other type of uh, options that we typically have for live use. The only other thing I wanted to mention is there's a, there's a camp coming up that I always do sound for, and that's for the Midwest Banjo Camp. So any of you who will be attending the Midwest Banjo Camp, feel free to uh, come up and say, hey, I'll be the one at the soundboard during the faculty concerts, so you won't be able to miss me. And any of you who don't know about Midwest Banjo Camp, that's at MidwestBanjoCamp.com. And they always have a, a great lineup of instructors to choose from. So that's worth checking out as well. Oh, and if you are at Midwest Banjo Camp and you come say hi to me and I end up getting off my butt and ordering some stickers, I intend to have some stickers made for specifically for the podcast. So... If all of those things happen, I will give you a free sticker at Midwest Banjo Camp if you come say hi to me. I hope I have them. Me even telling you about this is partly just to hold myself accountable. Now I'll now I'm going to feel pressure to make sure I go make some stickers for the podcast, which I've been meaning to do anyway, but you know how it is. I don't want to let people down. So, I hope to see some of you there. Today's episode features Jens Kruger of the Kruger Brothers. And for anybody who has seen them, undoubtedly you've been extremely impressed with their show and with Jens's abilities. He's one of the best players out there, one of the most generous people out there. He's always willing to to take time and has such a friendly disposition, especially toward other musicians who, who are asking him about his craft. And this conversation went no differently. He had just tons of cool things to say. And one thing that's been completely blowing my mind is he, I've, I've heard plenty of banjo music in my day, and he has a technique that was making sounds out of a banjo that I didn't even know were possible. And you'll, you'll hear what I'm talking about. He has this muted vibrato technique and you'll, you'll hear it. It was blowing my mind. I don't know what else to say about it. It was really cool. I had never heard anything like it. But I really look up to Jens and his his wisdom. He just seems to know everything about playing the banjo, about composing, uh, and just has a great attitude about music and has lots of wisdom to share. So I've rambled on enough. Here it is, Jens Kruger of the Kruger Brothers. I heard it on the radio, and of course at home we had uh, Dixieland, our father, had some Dixieland recordings, and I liked, te- liked the sound of the banjo. And then, uh, But mostly had, uh, plectrum banjo would be on those, right? Yes, but I also heard, you know, uh, bluegrass-style banjo, you know, on, on the radio. Uh, I was born... Sorry. I was born in 1962, so... Uh, there was still radio, you know, American Netforce, Network, you know, Forces Network that came out of Germany. 
and okay. that would be you know for the soldiers and it would be uh, it had a lot of you know rock music at the time of course and okay. they had their bluegrass shows you know so Bill Monroe as the Flat Earl Scruggs was on you know in the, the 60s Opry shows uh, not Opry shows you know just albums they played you know for, oh, okay. for the soldiers you know that yeah, was really cool uh, yeah so so I was exposed you know to Molly and Tim Brooks and uh, Foggy Mountain Breakdown and Beverly Hillbillies, you know, but it, all the things. I, I but I didn't know the names of all the tunes and the things. It was just the sound that was there, mm-hmm. and uh, I just loved the banjo sound. And of course, we uh, uh, had contact with a man who was a uh, folky from New York. He was uh, an American who uh, was a GI and uh, got stuck like in New York. Like a friend of your family. He was a. He was actually the dad of a a, a boy who went to kindergarten. With my mom was a okay. kindergarten teacher. And so he knew that we played banjo, and I was 10 years old uh-huh. at the time. And um, he, was, he took interest. He said, wow, these, you know, these kids playing banjo love American folk music. And so he was a folky, and he, of course, you know, he saw Pete Seeger. And he was one of these guys who was, his name was John B. McCarthy. And he uh, uh, was one of these guys who was at Washington Square, you know, singing yeah. And, yeah. Um, at the time. And... Uh, he loved folk music. He loved Woody Guthrie. He loved uh, Led, Led Belly and Pete Seeger, of course. And he um, introduced me really to the sound of Pete Seeger, or the, or the banjo, or that kind of claw hammer and um, style. And I was fascinated by it. And, uh, of course, then it was a mixture in Europe. You know, We'd, I didn't see banjo players. I just heard them on radio. Doing was that the did. first thing you tried to do, was a, a Seeger style? Well, I didn't know that there was a five-string or a tenor banjo. I just, yeah. It was just banjo. Yeah. And as a kid, you know, so I had a tenor banjo, and I thought I had to master tenor banjo before it would start to sound like bluegrass. Were you playing with a pick? or A, did... a plectrum, yeah. I was playing with a plectrum and, and just strumming the banjo and trying to learn, you know, Dixieland solos, which I did, you know. And okay. so I became a freelance musician when I was uh, 12 years old playing for Dixieland bands, you know. Oh, wow. Playing, so I played lots of Dixieland with actually fairly good people, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and um, I became sort of the sub-banjo player for Switzerland for everybody. That's amazing. Uh, and so I uh, started working for the radio orchestra when I was in fifth grade. Um, you know, when, if whenever they needed recording of tenor banjos, they would ask me. So, uh, and, you, and you still weren't sure about what the distinction was at that point? Or by well, then you I knew? started to realize, you know, that, that there was a style that was played with finger picks and, you know, yeah. and, uh, but I, uh, I was just playing every day and didn't think too much about it. And then I didn't have a five string banjo, so I had another tenor banjo and I put a screw in it and started to retune it, you know, and uh, did another, because it's a different tuning. Yeah. And my brother, um, a school friend of mine, he was on a vacation in America and uh, he brought back a five string banjo that he uh, purchased, you know, on a, on a farmer's market for 50 bucks or something. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so. They had it at home, hanging on the wall, and uh, he brought it to a show. They weren't even and, playing it? No, no, it didn't have <laughs> strings on it, no bridge, nothing, you know, it didn't have fifth string play. And Uwe saw it, and he said, well, how much you want for it? And uh, I, I can't remember. And Uwe just took the money out of his pocket and yeah. gave it to him. <laughs> and that was my first five-string banjo. And oh, Uwe brought it right to you? It, well, he, he was standing with me while I was looking at it, and so he... Uh, he just sort of gave me that, and and then I ordered a fifth string peg and set a five string banjo strings and a bridge and uh, so I set the banjo up and bought some finger picks and, uh, and then I had a little transition area between the five string playing and the tenor. Yeah, still uh, getting jobs doing the radio orchestra. Yeah, I was doing all kinds of things, you know, and being a sub uh, for Dixieland and. But I started then starting, you know, trying to figure out, you know, old Joe Clark and, mm-hmm. you know, Cumberland Cap and all these things, yeah. trying to figure out how to do the role. And, of course, there was no instruction. Yeah, how did you figure it out? Just by listening over and over? Just by listening it over and over, yes. You know, like uh, there, um, it's like old Joe Clark, you know. You know, that's, that's how Eric Weisberg would maybe play it. But uh, but um, I was learning it, you know, from Bill uh, Bill Emerson. From his recording, you mean? Yeah, Bill Emerson, and he had an interesting way of doing it. Instead of going, he would go. And I thought that was really cool, you know. Just and, a slightly different role yeah. pattern. Yeah. 
the, the nice thing about that is that you cannot just just move it up the neck and play it octave higher. <laughs> like that right, you yeah. know so but uh, you know i just tried to pick it up as good as i could i'm sure i made a lot of mistakes and i didn't really know that you would you know lead more with the thumb and i just you know slowly but surely you know figured it out how it was done and then uh, we became street musicians brother and i you know just started, the two of you yeah we, there was no more home so it was 40 years ago this year you know, uh, there was no more home, and we just left. And uh, Uwe and me, just I was 17, and I started working on the streets, you know, playing. And it was enough money to, to uh, get food. And we stayed sometimes with people or went to very cheap hotels or went to homeless shelters. Or uh, Where were you doing this? Uh, all over Europe, you know. So we started in Zurich, and then we went to Munich, Amsterdam, Berlin, Paris, you know, everywhere. And we lived on trains, you know, we bought Euro, Euro, Eurail tickets sure. where you could stay for a month or two, you know, and use all the, the trains that y you wanted to. Yeah, unlimited within the uh -huh. time period. Yes, there. right, yeah. And so we would, you know, maybe, let's say, play all day in Munich mm -hmm. and uh, make enough money, you know, to, to eat and be, and then take the latest, the latest train out of Munich and then go to Copenhagen, for instance, and then play all day in Copenhagen and then take the latest train out to Paris. And You're on tour already, yeah. So we, we'd been taking a train every night as far as we possibly could, the latest train out. Just a new, new city Just every a, time. So yeah. we could sleep on the train. Yeah. See, so this, this, the train became our hotel. Yeah. So we would sleep on the train. In the morning, we would get out and take the showers, you know, at the railway station. So Oh, I, so didn't, I didn't realize they, they, they had those. They always had showers at the railway station, okay. so you had to pay, you know, put money in. Uh, or pay prepay and mm -hmm. then you can take a shower and that's what we would do you know and then go out and play and go eat breakfast and play all day and make play, some more play, money yeah and play all night if we're lucky and don't get you know uh, get arrested by the police was that something that was frowned upon by a lot of police well yeah sometimes you know police would just arrest you and check you out you know if you were not some criminal or they take you uh, away from the streets or because, you see, uh, playing street music is a gray zone because you don't pay taxes, mm -hmm. right? You make money and a living, but you're completely uh, away from society. Right. So we did that for two years, you know. Uh, what do you think you, what would you say you learned as a musician from, from doing that for the two years? I think a lot, uh, really, uh, a lot. First of all, I learned about society a lot. When you're at the bottom of society, so to speak, you know, I didn't have a home, I didn't have a house or a parent's house I could go to. Yeah. Uh, you literally, like a bird, you know, you just roam around. And of course, I wasn't alone, I was with Uwe. And on the streets, there were a lot of other people who lived on the streets, who played music or, you know, did whatever to survive. Yeah. And uh, you become really close friends to these people, and you start to know that there's this big scene. Uh, sort of like an underground scene of people who live on the streets, and it was in the 70s, of course, and there was Americans who got stranded in, Amer in, in Europe because they'd been to the Vietnam War, could never find back into society, or, wow. and uh, just became musicians and just traveled the world, and, and we met up with them, and through them we learned lots of songs of Doc Watson and Gordon Lightfoot, and you know, a lot of people who had strong influence on us, and it was not about a career, you see, the music scene on the street was just you survive and you do what you love and you try to... And it was friendship was very much valued because right. there was, this, was your society. Everybody looked down up on you because you're standing on the street, you're worth nothing. Today, there is a little bit of different sentiment. You know, I can see that people value street music in a different way today. In those days, it was really different but they I thought you were a bum basically well you were really outside of the society and even yeah. you know when you were a musician in Europe at the time you know that people just thought well music isn't the real profession you know mm -hmm. and of course I I wasn't sure if it was either you know yeah. because I was making the barely making a living and but you uh, knew that you liked doing it the, 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 the advantage was that I was literally playing all day yeah you know so I was literally playing from morning till night when we were at home I could play a lot 
but not as much because we had to work a lot at home because we had, uh, you know, a butcher store and a restaurant and there was lots to do and I had hard work, get to up early in the morning, we had horses and, you know, I'd take care of everything. And so, but when I was on the streets and there was no more home and I, I could play every day, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours if I wanted to and right. you're young, you have energy, you, you play. And I think playing that much and playing loud all the time uh, because, you know, you cannot play introverted. Yes. Right. So I was never an extroverted person, you know, that would dance around or do a big mimics or things. I would just stand there and play as loud as I can, as interesting as I can, so people can... Hope that people notice. And... So people can stand or, you know, just throw something in the, in, in the case. And uh, I think that really helped me understand that the directness of what you do and the effect on people and how they react to you in positive and negative ways, yeah. You think you, you still use a lot of those skills, even with your, your performances today? It's interesting that, you know, I talked to Doc Watson. Doc Watson became really a good friend, and I'm very thankful for that, you know, uh, for the, the years that we knew him. And we played a lot of shows together and spent a lot of time together. And he yeah. was also, for years, he was a street musician. Oh, okay. You know, playing in Boone, getting his guitar out. And it was just, it was fascinating how much we bonded just to that fact Hmm. You know, that, that, that we knew that music needed to be playing, played in our situation. It needed to be played stern, not vague. Yeah. There was no place for being vague, yeah. vague, you know, vague on the street. Right. You had to be, and that's what you hear in Doc Watson's playing. It's not a question, do I want to play this or do I want to play this? No, I want to play this, mm-hmm. you know. Just decisive. I, I, yeah, there's a, there's a certainty of right. what you wanted to play and not looking for it. And I realized that if the more stern I am with what I wanted to play, the more money I could make <laughs> or the more people would actually be attracted to it in a certain you way. You noticed the difference when I noticed you would a strong have a certain difference. attitude. Yes, if I, if I would, you know, play, you know, if I would play... That's lounge music, you know. Mm-hmm. And it has not... The, it, this doesn't have the the energy, you know, to make people stop. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's people who are interested in that, but not enough, you know, for me to survive. Not when you're walking by on a sidewalk. No. It, right. was, it was what Earl Scruggs would have done. It was, you know, play loud and, you know, really, you know, show you here. Was that what was most successful for you in those days? Was Earl Scruggs' type of music? Or? Well, yes. And, and, of course, you know, I, I, I got exposed to... Uh, uh, great influence, like John Hickman. You know, he played things. You know, he played these licks. You know that I really thought, wow, I never heard anybody do this. Yeah. Or, you know, th- th- this this kind of mm-hmm. thing. Uh, he had, uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, so rhythmic things that are really attracted me and I thought wow that's that's really and he was so smooth yeah. and he had such worked out uh, you know uh, you know So he had great versions that had lots of sort of bounce and drive. So he was a big influence. And, of course, um, uh, Bela Fleck. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I heard him, you know, when he started playing with Spectrum. And uh, yeah. there was a few things that I heard, you know, on the streets. That I thought. He was also at the same time as, you know, as we were playing in the streets on Copenhagen, um, Bela Fleck played a concert, you know. There. Oh, he did? Of course, but I could never see him because, you know. With we didn't, Spectrum? I, I can't remember with what band he was. I think it might, be, might have been Spectrum. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It was in 1980. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but he was, everybody knew he's this great, you know, uh, new banjo player. Yeah. And, uh, but I never got to see him, of course. Oh, know? no. Because, you know, I didn't have the money to go sure, see the show sure. or anything. But I would have loved to. And, of course, Bill Keith, you know, mm-hmm. uh, was uh, very big because he was in Europe. And uh, he uh, played, you know, Alamandi at the time. So a lot of melodic players, it sounds like. Is, yes, is and, I loved, I, and I loved the melodic style, you know, additional to the Scruggs style. And sure. I sort of had a wild mixture of it. 
you know. Yeah. And, and then, you know, CBS Records saw us play on the streets. So we teamed up with two New Yorkers at uh, Mandolin and Bass, and they saw us play, and they gave us a record contract and a manager, and so we started touring. And uh, so Still started, in Europe, or they wanted you to go no, no, overseas? Played, no, no, I was in Europe. So, so we started playing uh, everywhere around Europe. And, and were you know, called the Kruger Brothers already? No, it was called Rocky Road. Okay. Yeah, because it was a, a suiting name for us being street musicians, yeah. you know, former street musicians, and so uh, it, was, it was called Rocky Road. And uh, it was very good for us, actually, at the time. But my, then my brother decided to go more country, mm-hmm. because there was more money in country, yeah. and he played guitar and sang, so he said, well, why don't I want to play electric guitar? There at still least, is, I think. You know, <laughs> so, and, and I thought, well, I'm going to stay with Bluegrass, and yeah. I saved that money. I worked for the railroads for a half a year and uh, cleaned train wagons, and... Uh, so we went, my wife and me, you know, my former, well, my, she was my fiancée at the time. Yeah. Um, we went to America and bought a Plymouth Duster in New York and drove out to Bean Blossom. I met Bill Monroe and I started playing shows with Bill Monroe. That was the first thing you did when you... When I came when to America, so I started playing with Bill Monroe on a regular you know, bass. Oh, well, that's incredible. Uh, so he enjoyed, uh, I don't know what he enjoyed about my playing, but there was a mystery when I met, when I met Bill Monroe. A, a mystery about what? About him? Well, it was... It was uh, when I saw him play, I was really taken by his performance because I've seen a lot of great musicians in my life before, but I've never seen actual visionaries, you know? Mm-hmm. There's a difference. Visionaries don't necessarily need to be the, the greatest musicians, let's say, but they have something that they bring to this world. Yeah. Right? They, they, there's people who can reproduce anything there is. But then there's people who bring something of their own that's very strong. Right. A strong vision. You know? And you consider Bill Monroe to be yeah, one him, of those people. Yeah, you could instantly tell that there was, a, there was a different page. It was not somebody who just copied you know, or could play anything anybody else could play. Yeah. You know? you know, he couldn't play like Jethro Burns or he couldn't play like... And he didn't care yeah. because he did his thing. And he did it with so convincing because he believed so strongly in his vision of what he wanted to, his music to sound like or what his presence just and then playing with him really I realized that you stand beside him and you feel completely safe there wasn't a weird feeling of maybe am I good enough or am I going to do this right he gave me so much confidence I felt completely safe interesting and and it was just a and music just happened to be good when you play with him and there was a magic because of his strong there was a vision sort of I, I, it's hard to explain, but it's, it's, it's a, there's an inner urge to create something, a sound, a way of doing something. And it's not technical or it's not describable in a harmonic sense. It's, it's just an inner urge for something. An attitude, maybe? A dream. Yeah. Maybe. And, and that's, uh, he was, and I saw that I was really taken by it. I was really fascinated. But the mystery was when I, I walked up to him after his show when I first saw him play, and I walked up to him and said, Mr. Monroe, I just want to thank you for your music because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I love your music. I think it's, it's, mar- it's marvelous, and I want to thank you for it. Uh-huh. And he just looked at me, and I didn't have my banjo with me, and he just looked at me, and he looked at me in the eye, and he just said to me, you know what, you're going to play with me tomorrow. And he turned around and walked away. Not even knowing what instrument you play or no, if you played he, it, anything. Nothing. Amazing. And so I went back to, 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 to my fiance, you know, to Krista, and I said, well, uh, she said, oh, did you talk to Bill Monroe? I said, yes. And he said, I should play with him tomorrow. And she said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so how were you feeling? Were you nervous about this? Or? Well, I, I, I thought I might probably misheard, you know. Uh-huh. So next day I, I, uh, I took my banjo to the stage in Bean Blossom, and I was sort of lingering around back there, you know, sort of standing there with my banjo case by the side of the tree somewhere. And Bill Monroe came in with this blue Cadillac that he had, you know. Jimmy Martin gave that to him, I think, a big blue ah. Cadillac. He came with this big blue Cadillac. And he got out of, the, out of the car, and he saw me, and he waved me over. and said, okay, I'm going to play a few songs, and I'm going to call you up. <laughs> and so, so I obviously didn't mishear. And, yeah. and I have no idea until today how he knew that I play or... And I have no idea. I have absolutely no clue. And that's what yeah. I said is a mystery. That's incredible. And so I, I played with him. People loved it. You know. Do you remember uh, which songs? I played Train 45, okay. Orange Blossom <laughs> Special. You know, I, he wanted me to show off. Yeah. And he wanted, you know, 
And I did. I, I, because I was on the streets, I, was, I could play really fast. I could play very crazy, you know. It was uh -huh. a little bit like uh, maybe Carl Jackson, you know, recordings of mm -hmm. the 73, you know, whatever, Bee Blossom, yeah. Orange Blossom. Orange Blossom know, special, Just yeah. crazy, you know, going full throttle. And I could yeah, play great. very clean and precise. I, I can say that today. You know, I was... I was 19, and I was in the, all cylinders were running. Yeah. So <laughs> who was who was his normal banjo player? Uh, Blake Williams. Okay. And uh, he was okay with you. Get, oh, he loved it. Uh, he Blake Williams, but you know, is one of the finest, finest people you could ever meet. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a uh, first class man. I think that's Bill Monroe. Uh, you know, he always told me how much he loved him and how much you know Blake Williams would take care of him and okay. make sure he's got everything where he needed and. Uh, he was really taking care of Bill Monroe, Blake Williams, you know, he's Interesting. a first-class person. And Wayne Lewis played guitar, and Mark Embry played bass, and um, uh, Kenny Baker played fiddle. And that's also when I played Grand Ole Opry then with Bill Monroe and um, uh, stayed with him on the farm for two months. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, so when did, when did all the Kruger Brothers stuff start happening? When did Uwe come over, and, and how did you...? Well... One thing you know was important. Is that skipping too much? No, 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 no. I just want to add one thing to Bill Monroe's stay. Bill Monroe was the one who actually told me. He said, "You know, we would sit in the kitchen at night and we play. You know, every midnight there was ice cream time. So he would have ice cream and we would sit in the kitchen and we'd ice cream and play. And then he would always ask me, you know, play me something. And I would play something and I would say, uh, "Oh, that sounds like Don Reno," or he would say, "That sounds like Old Scruggs." And then he said, "Do you write your own music?" I said, "Yes." So. So he said, play me something. And I had written something, you know, small. Mm -hmm. And then he looked at me and said, do you like it? I said, no. <laughs> and then he said, well, you see, Jens, he said, this is you, whether you like it or not. It's like when you look in the mirror, right? Yeah. Whether you like it or not, it's you, right? right. So and all you got is you. So all you got is this. So you better start doing something with that. You know, because yeah. you cannot be all Scruggs, you cannot be Don Reno. And America is a place where you can do as a hobby, uh, play something that other people played. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you can be influenced by them. But in the end, you have to present yourself. It sounds like that's the probably, probably the type of thinking that led him to have that attitude and dream that you were talking about earlier, where... He had this vision of what he wanted, and he was just very comfortable with it being yeah, see, him. He, he developed... Well, he, I don't know if anybody ever gets comfortable being himself, but, yeah. but you start to realize that there's no other way. Yes. You know? Because in 1997, when we then came and were invited to play with, uh, uh, you know, at Morofest uh, with Uwe and Joel, we, you know, why would I play uh, Earl Scruggs, you know, a piece if Earl Scruggs playing right after us? Or sure. why would I play something from Bela Fleck? Because he plays same day. Mm -hmm. Or why would I, you know, why would Uwe play a Doc Watson thing? Doc Watson's playing right. here. So the only justification for us to be there is to play something that I play and nobody else is playing. Yeah, and it's exactly. still accessible. Mm -hmm. It's still usable. So did, when, when Bill told you that, did that make you focus more on your own composing? Well, first not, because I didn't like it. You know, yeah. uh, I, because I said, well, I'm 19, I want to be, play bluegrass. And he said, don't do it. It was barely enough for me. <laughs> and so, and so, and, and I said, why, why shouldn't I do it? And he said, well, you're not from Kentucky. You know, you're from somewhere else and you have other ideas. Yeah. And so you have to be very honest about it. And, and he was very stern about it. We talked for nights about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you have to come up. I mean, you don't have to come up. You have to just play your music and play it clean. Mm -hmm. Play it powerful, play it with commitment, and don't judge yourself, you know, yeah. about liking it or not. You just have to do it, you know, and then people will do whatever with it, with it. And, and, and it's a very different s situation than when you're in, when you're just, uh, say, in a jam and you play a new song of uh, some great banjo player and you, you learned it and then you put it into the jam and you play it well and you, so it reminds you of the recording and you, it's, it's a great feeling that you sound a little bit like the, yeah, your hero yeah. and it's a beautiful feeling right. but that's not a career mm -hmm. right? the career is somewhere else and so that's why I always think amateurs have a, a wonderful life because they can be in that life 
Right. Right. And you know, when, so in my free time, I like to play bluegrass, and we get I get together with Bobby Hicks or you know people, and we play uh-huh. bluegrass. And and you get to sound like Earl Scruggs. And I get and to do fun. these things, yeah. and I love it. And I just you know <laughs> can sort of do a reenactment of things as good as I can, and yeah. I enjoy it. And Uwe and me, we play Doc Watson songs, like it, Clawhammer, and do Frosty Morn, and yeah. do all these things. And, but when I'm doing my job and doing my career, I have to concentrate on the things that I do. And uh, it's a different... And now I'm quite comfortable with it, you know. Don't stop listening. There's plenty more to come with Jens Kruger. But I really need to tell you about a really generous offer from Peghead Nation just for the listeners of the Picky Fingers Banjo podcast. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Peghead Nation. With Peghead Nation's streaming video courses... In banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, and ukulele, you'll learn bluegrass, old time, and other styles from some of the most talented players and instructors in roots music. Go to pegheadnation.com to see their great lineup of banjo instruction with courses like Beginning Banjo with Bill Evans, Bluegrass Banjo with Bill Evans, you can learn Clawhammer Banjo with Evie Layden, Wade Ward style banjo with Bruce Molsky, the banjo according to danny barnes so as you can tell some of the best instructors out there and they all have streaming videos on pegheadnation.com each of these courses include high quality multi-angle video lessons downloadable notation and tablature play along tracks plenty of tunes and songs to play and all you have to do is join any of peghead nation's video courses and you'll get a month free just by being a listener of the podcast So what you need to do is go to pegheadnation.com. You'll use the promo code. The promo code is PICKYFINGERS. Uh, You use that at checkout. That's PICKYFINGERS, one word, all lowercase, and enjoy 30 free days of amazing instruction. I'm going to sign up for it basically as soon as I get done recording this episode, and I encourage you to do the same. There's a lot of good stuff out there. So thanks, Peghead Nation, and I hope you all check that out. So speaking more from a banjo player's perspective, what were the things that you that you worked on that helped develop your your style of playing? Uh, well, I would I would say the the, the thing I worked on was um, developing taste in music. You know, let's say if I if I just play if I just play, and I have a, a one, a two, and a, a, one, a one, a three, and a five. Yeah, and. Now, do I always need them always? Can I do a chord like this? Can I do a chord like this? And if I only have two notes... You know, is it what I like? Is what I play actually what I want to hear and not just something that I did because I heard it on a recording or that I'm able to do? Is yeah. it something that I actually want to hear? You know, Is that how you approach it? You figure out what you want to hear and then learn what that is in your head well, on the banjo? Well, sometimes I noodle around, I get inspired you know, of what I hear. Yeah. But a lot of times better music comes out of me if I if I just imagine music and yeah. then try to learn it, which is right. sometimes easy because it's easier than I thought it would be. Yeah. And sometimes it's very hard. It might be impossible. Right? Well, almost impossible, yeah. Sometimes I write things that I really like. And it's very difficult, <laughs> you know. So, And then I have to sit there and I have to work out a long time. Yeah. And then I have other ideas where it goes... Things like that—they are yeah. easier to play, but just dif- more difficult to figure out because they they have these complex chordal the harmonies, harmony right. structures that I hear that I want to achieve, and then I have to figure them out somehow. I mean, I have to find them. So what I do is I sit and I sing the next notes before I start playing. You're teaching it to yourself. Yes, I, yeah. I, I, and that that feels in the end, these compositions always feel the best. 
the ones that I had in my mind mm -hmm. and then put them onto the instrument. Yeah. Uh, they're sometimes not the most fun, but they're the most satisfying over a long period of time. Probably the best way to learn how to be yourself, like Bill wanted you to. That's, that's yes. a, pure, a he, pure way of writing. Yeah, he said to me, he said, well, you, you can play pretty much anything you want right now, you know, when I was 19. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, uh, uh, you know, I studied a lot of scales and I studied all... <laughs> you know, I just started, uh, you know, studied, you know, anything that you could sort of, you know, do. And so I was very free, but I hadn't developed taste mm -hmm. yet. You yeah. know, I was able to play over chord changes in any, you know, way or play improvisation over Santa Anna's Real or whatever, you know. But to hear and have a taste about music it was not very developed, to say that. Yeah. And, you know, great composers, you know, like Mendelssohn, they would have had an amazing taste already developed, yeah. <laughs> which I hadn't developed yet. I was right. just able to do a lot of things. How, how did you develop, or, or actually, let me back up. Hearing what you just said you could do at 19, I'm, I'm imagining you playing that in front of Bill Monroe, and he has a reputation of being very closed-minded and stubborn about how bluegrass should be. And I'm, and I'm wondering, why, why do you think he, he took to you? Because that seems like the kind of thing that he would not have liked in, in a lot of people. But maybe I just have it wrong. I, I never met him, but I'm, I'm going by his reputation. I, I have no idea. Yeah. I tell you the truth, I, I don't know. He obviously, I mean, he liked it. Mm -hmm. He saw that I was able to do things and compose, and he wanted to encourage me. I think he really yeah. wanted to encourage me. He also said, you know, uh, go home, write a lot of music, come back to America. Yeah. Right? That's amazing. And so, uh, I, so I did, you know. So I went home. I studied a lot of music, you know. I was always interested in classical music. Yeah. So I studied a lot of counterpoint uh, I started a lot of, and I started, of course, a lot of jazz theory. Mm -hmm. I became also electric guitarist, and oh, really? that's actually how I uh, met Joel. We did the jazz standard gigs, oh, okay. and he didn't even know that I played banjo. You know, so we played, you know, in hotel lobbies, you know, and playing jazz, you know, just standard, you know, not, not, uh, you know, just uh, jazz, you know, just fake book stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so I learned a lot, you know, about modes and scales and you know, diminished and you know. Uh, low crins wow. and super low crins and you know everything that you want to know have, have you put a lot of that on the banjo yeah you okay. know, we know whatever you know it, it, it it's really doesn't matter yeah it, it, it let's say you know i i put everything that on the banjo but it's not the music that i do mm -hmm. you know of course right. i can go to a jazz session and play or but i but it's not the music i do right it's not what i do sure Another thing that you've told me about in the past, and this is quite a few years ago, you, I remember you explaining this technique that you have called floating, and it's maybe something that you and Ron Block well, did. Well, no, it's not what, what, I, what, what, what we did. I, I, it, Ron Block, you know, he has this technique where he leaves the first and the fifth string open. Okay. I, you know, at a time sometimes, you know, and he does a lot of, uh, let's say you have these positions like, you know, first finger on the first fret on the second string and the third uh, the, th the, the ring finger uh, B flat B right. flat here and if you take this position and then you and you go to up to the tenth and you the fifth third and you have passing notes like the sixth fret on the second string so It's like a modern type of bluegrass style, which sort of is a, um, because you're playing blues, uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, you, you're taking the first string and the fifth and just letting them ring because they're, they always fit. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then you just sort of put all these other notes in the middle and sometimes you take the first string. Uh, uh, That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, I could do Blum Monroe stuff and licks, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a way of exploring a lot of different color tones. Yes, right. Yeah. So, so this floating in the middle of this of the banjo, just yeah. sort of up and down, and uh, not really caring, worrying too much about the chords, 
really just playing sort of an expressive, you know, uh, avant-gardistic almost, you know, blues because style be, over it. Mostly because, and that works because those open strings sort of kind t- of root tie down. it together, yeah. yeah. They sort of tie it together. Yeah, that's and it's interesting. A very, it's a very interesting, so you wouldn't do an entire solo like that, but maybe the end of it or do something with it, you know, it sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a thing to explore. Yes, yeah, so it's sort of, you know, it's an airy sort of sound, mm-hmm. you know. An- another technique of yours that anybody who has seen you do is your vibrato technique yes. um why, why don't you either i don't know ex- explain how you came up with that and how you decide to use it it came up you know i came up with that because i played lots of telecaster you know in bands so oh. so you need to mute constantly mm-hmm. yeah. yeah to get a chicken picking kind yeah, of sound so, yeah, yeah so you got to mute constantly right. and because you got to mute uh, i started doing that on the banjo like on the guitar you would in Chad Atkins style, you know, where you... you know. Oh, yeah, that's a, like a right-hand palm mute. Yeah. Yeah, right, so, 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 and then if I, if I just mute and, you know, play the strings and then let go, mm. uh, then the string doesn't have the f- first impulse. Yeah. Right? Yep. So if I keep it muted, it just dies. But yeah. if, I, if I mute it and let go, I just eliminate the first impulse, but I have just a sustain of it. Yeah. Okay, so if I, so now if I then move the the, the neck, I, I'll just show it without mute, just a little bit. That gives me sort of a little bit of a chorus, right? right. So I can go, and then I can add. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Leslie speaker. So, so I, I use that a lot. Between, that's for instance, like with like that, and then Uwe plays solo. Maybe go. So it, he- it helps. That's very cool. It helps. I really the, like that. <laughs> it helps yeah. to bake a, a backup for the guitar to float on better. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, yeah, you, you're creating. More, it seems like more sustain than it should have. Yeah, because but, uh, I'm creating more sustain because I eliminate the first impulse. Yeah. So I'm not playing quiet at all. Mm-hmm. I'm actually playing very loud. I'm just eliminating the top. Yeah. You know, so so it's not like if I would play this without, it would be like that, you know. Yeah, but. yeah you just keep your... And I guess I'm more describing it for the people listening who can't see you. Um, yeah, you just keep your right hand on the strings just for that first moment to where the attack would be, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about the the band you have. A lot of these ideas and and the original music you were writing. I, I imagine that a lot of that is what you are well, performing so, or have performed throughout the years with so, your band. Yeah. So so we of course we have a stock of songs that we just sort of doodle and have a lot of fun with, you know. Yeah. And, and and we we throw them in once in a while, not to make the program too rigid, you know. Mm-hmm. Even though they they seem, but we we arrange everything. Heavily. I mean, everything is very thought out. Yes. Even though if it's simple, it doesn't matter. It's always thought out. So when we jam or we just get another musician to play with us, it always destroys the arrangement, right? Mm-hmm. So it's good for certain songs to do that. It doesn't matter how good the musician is. He will not know our arrangement. Yeah, he, he hasn't been to rehearsal. It, no, so, so, so it will always be an improvisation, which is fun and can be really good. And uh, I enjoy doing but to create an entire program like that is not what I want. I would like to actually work out music really, really thoroughly. Okay. You know, I don't like to improvise too much. I like to actually work out the music. Yeah, more. that's very apparent watching watching the show that it's it's very orchestrated, even down to little yeah, little, little rhythms. And... I, I love that, and and so I'd rather work with a string quartet, for instance, uh, where I have everything written out, and so the notes come really where I wanted them, from everybody. 
inclu yeah. including me. I'm I'm also in a corset. You know, I'm not playing freely. I I, I play. It. I'd rather focus on the expression of how I play it mm -hmm. than the notes. I don't want to think about the notes anymore. It would be like a somebody who uh, plays Shakespeare. He doesn't think about the, the words. The words don't change, right, right. It's the same words, right. uh, but it's the way he interprets them. And so I like to have the focus. I, I like to be freed from the burden of the notes. I like the notes to be good. Yeah. It's like a good text. And it takes a while to come up with a good text. I don't want to come up with the text on stage for my music. Mostly. I'm saying yeah. mostly. Sure. I like to really come up with a text that I want to say. And then how do I say it is where my focus is really going to be. Yeah. So on stage, I want to have every night have a little freedom of how am I going to say this text. I really want to look forward to saying. Yes. And so that gives me great pleasure. And I, it gives me also joy to do it almost every day. Mm -hmm. because it releases me of this burden of trying to find what am I going to say tonight. You've already put in that work to, I, to yes. figure out what you're going to say. This is the program. This is what I want to say. I want to say certain things. And, I, and then it's how am I going to say them tonight? Yes. Uh, this is it's a different challenge than maybe improvising every night, trying to find a new angle of improvisation, which I also like. We have a few tunes where I do this. But the majority, let's say 90% of our show is is the, the notes are where they need to be. Is that part of the, of the reason you've had this, you've had a three-piece band and you've lasted for quite a long time, is that part of the reason that you need to have that consistent group in order to execute all these things? Exactly, in the way that... exactly. You know, of, of course, when I, when I, let's say I just finished a new uh, big commission piece for symphony, mm -hmm. and so for Joel to learn all this music is enormous work, you know, and uh, I mean for everybody. Uh, but, uh, but, I can just print out the, the sheet music for Joel, right? Yeah. So Joel can play it from sheet music. Uwe doesn't read music. So uh, we play, and I write about a chart, maybe, you know, and he plays it with the chart, and he finds the way on the guitar, how it's best for him to, uh, to approach it on the guitar. But then we work a long time. And actually, it's an interesting point. When I was a young, I always thought all the music that I heard at Flat and Scruggs do and all this, it seemed so many notes, and I knew that they're playing without music, that I thought, this is probably all improvised. Until I listened to a lot of shows, you know, when I was with Todd Taylor, he had, you know, dozens and dozens of live shows of Last of Flat Earth Scruggs. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, every week he recorded them, you know, for months and months. Uh, and then he, I realized, yeah, they're playing exactly the same show. I mean, it's the same jokes. The, the, the solos only <laughs> changed, only, the solos only changed if Earl Scruggs maybe made a little hiccup. Yeah. Uh, but the, the solos were mainly the same. The backups was mainly For the same. For all of the musicians? All the musicians, yeah. you know. It was actually a very orchestrated music. It's like uh, when you listen to Alice Krauss, I mean, there's not much, there's not that much. I mean, there's always a little wiggle room for the dobro and some backup here and there. But basically, the music is extremely orchestrated. Very consistent. Very, yeah. very consistent. And, and that makes the quality so good because you you realize, okay, last time I played this note a little earlier and I think it's better if I play it even earlier or less. Or, and you really get down to the nitty-gritty of one note. Yeah, that's a very microscopic right? look you're, at it. You're yeah. not like, okay, uh, let's try a, a complete different substitution. Mm -hmm. You know? Right, yeah. Up the neck with this other roll <laughs> let's, or let's down the neck. You know, yeah. you're just really thinking, am I going to... or I'm going to do... Or, you know, you think in, yeah. uh, in these sort of parameters and I and I once talked to Doc Watson about it and he, he said to me you know Jens it, it takes me a long time to come up with something that's worth playing for people wow I, I like that he put in a lot of work yeah and, and you see you no know, all the things I'm saying here is not something that uh, that applies I mean it's not it's not a general truth I, I'm just saying you know it's a personal preference you know that's what I, you like yeah yeah uh, you know it has no <laughs> you say general the truth of music is that's the nice thing about music anybody can do everybody can do anything he wants to do mm -hmm. and if he and, and he if he likes it or he enjoys it and people enjoy it that's, that's all right you know I mean but Absolutely. as a but um, but I've been playing for people I, professionally you know uh, I had my first paying show in 1973 okay right so and then I've been full time you know playing every day for my life uh huh uh, for 40 years and of course in that time you you think a lot about you know do I like my job 
right? Is this what I want? Mm -hmm. uh, and I used to say, you know, we get paid for traveling, playing's free. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I also enjoy traveling, actually, to be true, to be honest, you know, I, I love that. But the banjo itself, I, I, you know, I don't want to make, uh, you know, don't sound one of sound advertisers or something, you know, but I... I was going to ask you anyway, uh, so <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, 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 to actually come up with my music, I need the banjo with more sustain. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a few old Gibsons and I have a few, um, you know, valuable instruments and they're all not good for what I do, mm -hmm. right? They're all, I could not have done what I do with this. You know, so uh, this is this has well, and and tell everyone what this what this is. Okay, this is a, is a Deering banjo, and I've been working with the Deering Banjo Company for 12 years now. Right, I'm the, the uh, director of research and development, so I design all their banjos. You are? Yes, I, I, am. I did not know that. Yes, uh, so wow. so so I'm working on the metallurgy. I'm, we're working with the woods with uh, the design of the tone from all the banjos. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, so... But you do have specifically a, a signature model. Yeah, which incorporates a lot of the things, you know, that I like about it. It's a stainless steel. It's a, it's a, it's a steel uh, um, uh, tailpiece, mm -hmm. which gives me a lot more stability on the... Uh, uh, it doesn't resonate. You see, there's no sound. A lot of tailpieces go do, 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 you know, do all kinds of things. Yeah. And I like the tailpiece to not give. I like this... And uh, it's really stable. There's no uh, going It's a very on. direct note yes. and not as many overtones. So uh, then I use stainless steel frets mm -hmm. because then I don't have to worry about them uh, wearing down. So I can play the same setup for a long time. Sure. And they sound great. They're always polished. See what yeah. I do? They don't go... Yeah, no scratchy. Know. So I can use them for years. Uh, they don't ever change. Sound mm -hmm. fantastic. And uh, then uh, I have a little bit of an arch in the fingerboard. Not as much as maybe Bella would have or other people. Uh, I just have an, as much as about a, you know, a Martin guitar would have. Okay. Uh, just because I played so much guitar. Like a 14 or 16 uh, inch, uh, something like that. Yeah. So. And, and what do you think that that adds that's a big debate where it doesn't uh, add anything really i mean i i i would i, mean, I would just play the same on a flat fingerboard it, it wouldn't really matter that much it was just from a time where i would switch guitar, between guitar and banjo and i just have a similar radius yeah that makes sense feels more the same but basically it doesn't matter like in classical guitar they're all flat sure and andrea Segovia, you know you wouldn't argue, or Paco de Lucia, you would not argue, you know, that they would yeah. have been any better, you know, with the arch fingerboard. Yeah, he does okay. He, yeah. he does, they all did okay, you know. <laughs> so it, that's not an argument, uh, really. Uh, I don't think it's faster or anything. It's just, it was a transition from one instrument to another. That was a little bit... Yeah. But even today, I wouldn't worry that much anymore, really. The, uh, the instruments that I've played of your signature models, they all tend to have a, a rather chunky neck. Do you think that that adds to the sound as well? No, well, actually, they used to be more chunky, and now they're not. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I use, I use 11 strings, you know. I use 11, 12, 13, which is considerably heavier than most people yeah. would use today. Even Ron Block, you know, people like that would maybe use a 9 or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 10. Sure. 9 and a half is a lot. Um, but I get, when I play, you know, when you... I have more more tone mm -hmm. on one string. Yeah, it's not so as when I go, twangy. Yeah. You know, so it's, it has more tone. Yeah. So, and then the head, I use it around G. Oh, slightly lower than it's, what a lot of people would. Yes, it's, it's a G. Yeah. And, and it, what kind of head is it? It's Remo. So I went uh, with Greg, you know, I went to visit Remo Bella, and I told Remo Bella, you know, uh, years ago, I said, well, your banjo heads break because they're glued in, mm -hmm. and the banjo head has a lot more tension than uh, uh, a, a snare. A drum, right. A drum, so, because it's a lot it's tighter. So it pulls it out, and the banjo heads, you know, pull out of the, the glue. Maybe not all the way, but they, they, they're not even anymore. Enough to ruin it, and, yeah. And they just don't sound good. Some of them sound good because they don't pull out as easy as others. But if they start sounding, pulling out a little bit, well, you have an uneven uh, head, and it really doesn't sound that good. And yeah. I said to him, 
they would sound, and even, you know, for the Deering Banjo Company, it was important, you know, they would change, the, put, put on the head, and they would have a certain percentage that would break mm-hmm. by putting on. So I said, why don't you crimp the head? Okay. And they had, at that time, you know, in Taiwan, they had a little uh, plant where they would, you know, crimp heads. Mm-hmm. But the mylar wasn't, from DuPont, it wasn't, it was a different kind of mylar. Okay. And it wasn't that good sounding. It was a different material. And also different uh, frosting. So I said, why don't you, you know, crimp it and, uh, with your material that you usually use? And so Remo said, okay, let's do it today. And so they changed the heads at that moment. So that's why these And when are, was that? That was uh, about eight years ago, ten years ago. So ever since then, uh, the, the banjo heads that they make uh, so, so they incorporated st- that? Well, actually, first they start, just started making it for deering. Okay. And now all the Remos you see, they're crimped. Because they, they, it's because I, I told them that, that uh, they would, uh, uh, and they actually tune better. You see the sound, you can hear better sound. Better and, and what happened in a few years ago, they had to change the, the mylar because DuPont doesn't use the same mylar anymore. Oh, really? Okay. And it's actually a better mylar. It's just a little, unco- it's just a little different to listen to at first. But uh, these new Remo heads, uh, they are absolutely phenomenal. You can, oh, and yeah. it's just the regular frosted top just ones the regular that you get tops, yes. anywhere. Yeah. And they're just fantastic. I mean, you put them on and you just don't tie them too much. And so that's good. Uh, my, my bridge is about 2.3 grams. Mm-hmm. So, is uh, that a Deering bridge? Yes. Yeah, it's a Deering bridge. And I, I came up with a design. It's called Smiley. Well, it, Greg came up with that name, but where the middle foot is actually taller than the side. Right. And so it actually, because a bridge would always sag after a while, mm-hmm. because, you know, it's wrong. The bridge has to have a sort of a little bit of a curve to give a little counter to the... As the much fle- contact with a little the bit. head on the that so, underside. Right? So it doesn't have the, the stress or just on the outer feet, you know, also on the middle foot. And it helps the bridge to rock better because it stands in the middle and it actually transfers sounds much better to the outside of the, of the banjo head. Yeah, how cool. Well, that's amazing. I saw Joel walk in. I, w- I wasn't sure if he was trying to. Uh, no, no. If he was trying to, trying to get. <laughs> Another memory I have of you is that you you looked at a tone ring. This is this is back at the guitar store, and you picked up a tone ring, and you, you know, you clocked it with something, and you listened to it, and you, you said that you knew what it was made of just by, by hearing the decay of the notes. And uh, I have no way of knowing whether you were right or not, but you, you seemed pretty confident with it. Where did you pick up the ability to, to do that kind of thing? Well, I, I can't exactly tell, but I can, I can pretty much tell. I can tell a lot of things. It's like somebody who drinks wine <laughs> a lot. <laughs> he, can, he can taste, yeah, this is, a, this is a Merlot, and this is, you know, Cabernet, and this is... Uh, maybe you know a Malbec or whatever, uh, but you know for me it's um, uh, I worked so much with foundries, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, we did I developed hundreds of uh, hundreds of uh, prototypes of tone rings, and I working did with Deering or working with Deering through foundries with Deering and myself before I even worked with Deering, mm. because I took some old you know uh, Gibson tone rings and we uh, had them analyzed and. We did analyzing, you know, of these tone rings at the National Institute in Switzerland of metal, uh, of material. And so they gave, they could even tell me how hot the copper was when they put the tin in. Oh, wow. I mean, because of what happens chemically, you know. I mean, they could find any trace and they analyzed it to me completely. And I did a bit of a few uh, different rings and a few different things. So I How much variation, I'm I'm just sorry to interrupt. How, How much variation, if you give them two old Gibson rings, how different would they would they be well that would be very difficult to answer because you know uh, maybe they have a batch that's very similar and then they have a batch that's not i mean for the ones we analyze there's quite a difference but not as much as you would think and actually it's a very simple it's a very simple metal and it's very crude crudely made it's not it's not a really high refined Mm -hmm. uh, uh, metal Uh, you know it's uh, it's it's what called maritime bronze uh, okay. Red pouring. It's a regular industrial standard uh, material. It's five um, percent zinc, five percent uh, tin, five percent, four percent lead. So it can machine it better, okay. and um, the rest is copper. 
Interesting. And, and so some in some of them you have three percent lead or five or six, and some of them have yeah. the seven percent tin. Some percent, you know, but it's basically all sold as the maritime red pouring, right? Okay. And so it's pretty much a very simple material. And they were uh, not poured in uh, individual sand cast. There is casting. They were poured actually as a tube. The ones I had analyzed, they were tubal, uh, tubal pourings, not individual sand cast. Sand cast was used for prototypes, okay. but the production was a tube, and then they just saw the tube and drill it and take all the, the shavings and put it back into the pot. Yeah. And so that's why you have all these variations because you never know what you put back in the pot. You know, yeah. I mean, you just throw it in there. It it's can the, change it's a little the bit. 30s. Yeah. Forget it. You know, I mean, it's it's just whatever. And there's not that much magic about a tone ring, actually, to be true. And, you know, I've, I have plenty of banjos that are old, uh, really bad banjos, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not good, uh, just not very responsive. And Basically, you can make any banjo sound good or bad. You know, it has a lot to do with the player and of what he knows, you know. And you know that, you know. You have uh, J.D. Crow, you know, he would not ever like, never liked the banjo of Ralph Stanley, you know, because it was arched up. Or, yeah. Uh, just the personal preferences of what you get used to and what you expect to hear when you play has a lot to do with you, if you like the sound or not. Yeah, uh, definitely. And, uh, and but uh, what I needed was a was a sound that is um, that is, has a, enough sustain that's clean, mm-hmm. you know. And and so so when you're doing your your design work for Deering, does most of what you design have that? image of what you want in mind to have a lot of sustain or do you try to, well, to vary it for oh i vary it a lot you know uh, for instance the tone ring i have in my banjo is a uh, is a little heavier and uh, and terry Bolcom model for instance is a, is a lighter tone ring mm-hmm. and um, uh, we have different you know little different you know aspects of things uh, because everybody's different you know everybody wants wants a little bit something something yeah. different you know but I tried you know on your question again you know I tried so many tone rings that we did tone rings completely out of copper we did them out of you know oh, wow. we did them out of completely out of you know all kinds of materials and we made uh, tone rings with uh, 20 80 bronze we made tone rings out of you know 12 percent lead yeah. and, and we made them so I've listened to so many tone rings <laughs> and I know how they how they react and I have actually literally hundreds of tone rings at home um, you know that we did as prototypes, Just experimental and, ones, and yeah. so I tried them all, recording in banjos, tabbing. I, I would argue I could tell you if you bring me a tone ring, I could tell you pretty much what it's made out of and probably uh, what's in it. You yeah, know, not that's very cool. Not all the ingredients, of course, but mainly just the bulk. You know yeah. what, what's in there, and but I'm telling you, if the tone ring's not too hard. Mm-hmm. That's good. If it's too soft, that's that's not good either. Like it, just copper itself, you know, sounds just too dead. It, it takes up too much vibrations away. So copper or lead would make it too soft. It or? just it just sort of starts sounding. It starts over ringing in itself because there's uh, there's a weird overtone dampening going on. Mm-hmm. And if the tone ring's really 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 hard, you know, it starts to sound a little tinny on the finger pick end. Okay. So. But but even a, a really good hard tone ring, you know, could sound fantastic, and so does the soft one. Yeah. But but I like something in between, you know. That's that's not too harsh on the finger pick. You can Best sense both worlds. Yeah. You know, that's not too harsh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I these days, you know, I can, I, you know, with the Kruger Brothers, I compose a lot of music. Yeah. I write almost every day something you know I come up with some idea mm-hmm. and then uh, so writing for string quartet was very important for me in the last years the writing all these commission works for champion music america and uh, national endowment of the arts you know and doing all these commission works you know are you self-taught in terms of that have you have you studied classical composition in some way or are you not formally but of course i, I started 40 years ago by buying books you know, or, or uh, borrowing books and talking to composers, talking to arrangers, talking to, uh, and so learning about the instruments, learning about the staff writing, you know, learning about all that, and of course counterpoint and harmony structure, and and so I learned a lot of yeah. that, you know. Otherwise, I, you know, I, I just finished a piece for Union Pacific, 
you know, and the town of Ogden, and the big symphonic piece. Okay. And it cannot be too experimental because it's an American piece, <laughs> right? It's a, yeah. it's a patriotic American piece. So, it has to, so I want it to be grand and clean, clear, yes. large and um, Sousa-esque. Sousa, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> some, some, some parts of it. And of course, you know, um, uh, also questionable. You know, very, very, you know, like. Uh, you know, stuff like that, you know, more, yeah. more, more intricate things. And then, of course, you know. Um, but to write music that it sounds right, you know, in an orchestra, to set the instrument, you have to know the instrument orchestra. And you sort of have to learn a little bit, you know, to make it the sound, you know. Yeah. To, it's more than just, I want this note. They can, yeah, the violin will play that one. Let, let's say yeah. you're making a tutti, you know, making a tutti, an entire chord of an orchestra. Yeah. Runs, you know. Mm -hmm. There's so many different approaches, you know. Let's say if you, if you take, you know, some American composers, you know, you would see like Hans Zimmer, you know, he would, let's say, you know, uh, he would use a lot of ones and fives. Okay. Not a lot of thirds, right? Yeah. In a, in a tutti chord. Maybe one third in a in an oboe or somewhere, you know, yeah. in a flute. Mostly just a power chord. Yeah. Just a power chord, one and five. But when you look at Beethoven, for instance, uh, starting the Sixth Symphony, right, you would, you would hear just ones and about three different threes, but not a single five. Huh, interesting. Right? So, so there's a different approach of how the sound actually is achieved, mm -hmm. you know, of uh, you wouldn't just have a whole bunch of threes and a whole bunch of fives, you know. And the threes yeah. are very difficult. If you, have a th uh, if you have a third, you know, very low in the orchestra, for instance, uh, a third has a fifth that rings as an overtone. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that doesn't... It that, can that, confuse uh, the sound will, of and, it. Yeah. And that will clash with the one. Right. Right, so... so uh, uh, so, so that would be difficult, you know. Like, like, like if you if you have a, a the, the third of a G is a B, uh -huh. and the over the the, the, the fifth, you know, and the and and the, and the fifth is an F sharp. Now you're going to have that, or the third, you know, that's going to hurt. It's going to be a D a, a, a D flat, you know, a D, D sharp. So that's you're going to hear that in the sound, and and so you have to be really careful where you use them. And and like say, uh, things that sound good at home maybe don't sound good at the orchestra. Yeah. So you want to know how this all works, um, and then you are more freely <laughs> to yeah. work, you know. Yeah, and I imagine you're improving with each each one as you as you hear how it turns out. You might uh, yes, learn and some I, things to do I, for next time. Absolutely, and I love I love that process. And uh, yeah, but uh, and so this is a two worlds that I do. You know, I compose a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I just did six weeks of straight composing every day. You know. And now I'm on the road playing, and I'm really happy to do that. <laughs> Is this the easy part? <laughs> I don't know. It's challenging in a different way, but I love it. You know? yeah. and tonight is this beautiful little place here, and yeah. it's, it's gorgeous. Well, we love it, too. It's, it's great. I, lo I love your music and oh, thank really you. respect what you do. seems like you can do just about anything. No, no, no. That, that wouldn't be true. <laughs> I mean, uh, but uh, I mean, there's people that I really admire, you know, like, like Ryan Kavanaugh. He's an amazing... I mean, he can just play about anything. Or Noam Pichelny, you know, when you look at these people. I'm so happy that they are here and they play out there because they make my life so much easier because they give the, the world such great banjo music that mm -hmm. they expect great things of a banjo and and that makes it beautiful you know for me to work gives it more respect you mean well for it, people yes i think you know the banjo is looked up you know looked at as a as an instrument that is a really cool great instrument yeah because great and cool people play it out there you know <laughs> like noam and all these people they're fantastic human beings you know they do great things and and I can be part of that world. I'm very happy, thankful yeah, for yeah. that. Well, I know a lot of them look up to you, too. Uh, how, how do people find your music on the Internet if they want to oh, well, they come can, see you? Uh, uh, come see me? Come see you or, or like, come uh, to a performance? Oh, they, or? They, our website is the easiest, you know, KrugerBrothers.com. And uh, you can go and uh, you can order the CDs there or download it from there or go to Amazon or, you know, find us. Um, we also have an academy where I teach, you know, every year. Which, which academy is that? It's our own. It's the Kruger Brothers Music Academy. Oh, I'm not and sure if I knew about that. Yeah, it's, about, it's five years old or six years old now. And we're doing it in Wilkesboro. Mm -hmm. It's always the weekend after Merlefest. And I get to talk about musical concepts. So that's just in a few weeks Yes, here. I'm yeah. really looking forward. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And we have a great setting and it's for all levels. And I get to talk about uh, musical concepts 
uh, that I found to be very important in music that I couldn't find in any books. Yeah. So I can talk about how to improvise and think differently about the banjo. Uh, oh, that'd be incredible. Uh, that, that's and that's great. a lot, a lot of fun. So I have yeah. every level, pretty much from beginners to professionals coming. And um, Are you the only banjo instructor for that? Actually, or? I am. <laughs> okay. And so people, I can get to really talk, you know, uh, uh, meat and potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that'd be incredible. I wish we had time to discuss all of those, get all of your secrets, but then it would ruin your camp. They, no, they, no, no, they, not at all. <laughs> I'll be glad to talk to you anytime you like to. Oh, man, that's great. Okay, Jens. Well, I got to get you to that's all right. to sound check. Your uh-huh. band is hovering. Yeah, that's all right. Giving me dirty looks that's over there. That's all right. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. I have tickets for tonight, so I'm looking forward to that, and I'll, I'll okay. be seeing you for I, that. I hope I get to hear you too. Anytime. I got my picks. <laughs> I, di- I didn't. I didn't bring my instrument though. So you can try mine. Okay. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast featuring Jens Kruger of the Kruger Brothers. Once again, special thanks to Jacob Howcroft and Ron Chapman for being the Patreon supporters of this show. You can go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast and become a supporter of the show. Don't forget to go to pegheadnation.com and enter Picky Fingers, all one word, lowercase, at checkout, and you'll get 30 free days of amazing streaming instructional videos from banjo teachers like Danny Barnes, Bill Evans, and Evie Layden. You can always email the show if you have any questions, comments. That is pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. And beyond that, that does it for me today. Hope to see you all at Midwest Banjo Camp. I know you can't all come. You're all over the place. But to those of you who will be there, look forward to it. Come introduce yourself. And that's all for me for now. I'll see you all next time.